Hey, what is going on? It is Friday. Happy Friday, February 25th, 2022. And uh, today I am going to take a little bit of a detour from the cell cycle because uh, I realized I'm doing things in a little bit of a haphazard order, and that's fine. Um, but there is an important part of biochemistry that I wanted to veer into to make sure that it's fully understood and accounted for in this study of uh, longevity, life science, and uh, life extension, and that specifically is ubiquitination. Okay, so that's an interesting word. That word has always caught my fancy, uh, but it's important because ubiquitination is the process by which proteins are tagged for uh, degradation uh, by uh, protein complexes called proteasomes in the cell and those uh, the resultant uh, refuse generated by these proteasomes uh, in the form of uh, amino acid chains uh, which are then further degraded by proteases later on uh, are um, essential to uh, reclaim and reuse by the body and the cellular processes in order to um, uh, redo everything once again, like go build energy for the cell, uh, build more proteins, etc. Do everything else amino acids do. So the reason I veered into this besides that nice little fact is that uh, we were talking about cyclins last time and uh, cyclin uh, protein cyclin involvement in the cellular uh, phase transitions, right? Uh, so at checkpoints uh, in the cells, uh, cyclin regulation occurs, um, and cyclin interaction with cyclin-dependent kinases occurs, so that the cell can move through the different phases of its life cycle, including mitosis, the G1 phase, S phase, etc. Um, so at some point, the cyclin cyclin-dependent kinase is uh, kinase protein which is always present but it's activated by the cyclin molecules of the different variety A, B, C, E, etc., A, B, D, E, whatever. Um, but the issue is that the concentration goes up and down and once these cyclins are no longer of use because the certain, uh, s certain cyclins are used during uh, certain parts of the cycle, right? So uh, you can see here, this is when you have the cyclin, G1 cyclin, G1, S cyclin, S cyclin, M cyclin, and these have like, these these cyclin concentrations uh, are, um, you know, indic indicative of the cyclin kinase cyclin activity that occurs during this uh, phase, right? So uh, the more of the cyclin complex that's uh, uh, complex with the cyclin dependent kinase the more of the cell cycle is regulated at that point but once the cyclin you see when the uh, cyclin concentration goes down then the phase progresses right but here's the here's the issue uh, the, how does this go down, right? So then we have to go back to some basic, more basic biochemistry and talk about the degradation of proteins because the cyclins have to be degraded and how are cyclins known to be degraded? They're ubiquitinated, okay? So again, ubiquitination is, um, it's a multi-step process. Uh, there are three enzymes that are involved in ubiquitination uh, primarily. Um, they're called E1, E2 and E3, right? So uh, there's a, E1 is uh, the ubiquitin activation enzyme, E2 is the ubiquitin uh, transfer enzyme, and E3 is the ubiquitin ligation enzyme. Okay, so basically it's a ligase. So uh, essentially what happens, and the steps, the steps are really, um, I'm going to go over the higher level steps because the higher level steps are important to understand. Uh, essentially, E1, uh, at this, this molecule called ubiqu ubiquitin, is attached to E1, the E1 enzyme. So ubiquitin is the primary actor and reagent in this. A protein is understood by your system to be able to be degraded by this guy here, this proteasome here, if it's been ubiquitinated. Okay, so yeah, that's what I'm gonna step back to. Uh, what is a ubiquitination uh, process of a protein 
what, what happens there. A protein essentially uh, needs to have these all these UB molecules attached to it. And the UB molecules are attached to the polypeptide at, this is the target protein, the UB molecules are attached at lysine residues on the target uh, poly uh, polypeptide. So there has to be enough uh, uh, ubiquitin attached to a polypeptide in order for the proteasome, this, this thing here, to sort of garbage dispose of the protein, right? Like if the, enough of these aren't here, then certain parts of this proteasome will ignore this um, uh, protein. And this is called multi-ubiquitinated uh, multi protein. There has to be, I think, at least four before the protein is uh, tagged for proteasomal degradation. Okay, so that's like a safety mechanism because you don't want this thing running rampant into your system and degrading every single protein. So you need to, uh, you need to do it, quote, intelligently, unquote. So back to what happens, what's the process, right? Once, how does a protein get tagged for ubiquitination? And remember, the protein is tagged in its lysine residue, so that's where these enzymes come into play. So a ubiquitin uh, molecule, right, which has this carboxylate end here, this ubiquitin molecule is um, first attached to this E1 protein, right? This E1 protein, uh, <coughs> the, I'm not going to go through the molecular structure, but the E1 protein uh, basically is, has two sub-steps in its attachment phase where uh, it uses ATP get, and it gets rid of a phosphate called the pyrophosphorus from the a ATP and attaches AMP to the E1 molecule, uh, to the ubiquitin in the, in the E1 molecule, okay? So this is the result of this step here. So And this this bond here is at, it's called a thioester bond because this is a sulfate. A uh, thioester, remember, is a sulfate-based uh, ester, right? And uh, the E1 has a sulfate bond um, at a cysteine residue, most likely, because that's where thioester bonds are formed. Uh, this then ubiquitin is carried right uh, to some distance where another the secondary enzyme comes by and this is a transferase the secondary enzyme and honestly i don't know why this is necessarily required by the body there must be some evolutionary regulatory mechanism which requires there be an intermediate uh, transferase involved in this process but uh, essentially, this transferase then does the same thing and kind of takes the ubiquitin off the E1, and it's attached in the almost pretty much you see the same manner, right, through a thioester bond to E2. Then the E2 enzyme finally, what happens via E3, is attached to a target protein, and the target protein uh, is attached via. Uh, to this lysine residue, okay? So this lysine residue uh, through this NH bond is called a isopeptide bond, okay? This isopeptide bond is pretty much uh, a, a representative of a ubiquitinated or mono-ubiquitinated, sorry, that's a mouthful, mono-ubiquitinated protein, okay? And then this occurs many times over until finally, the protein is multi-ubiquitinated, right? So this is the multi-ubiquitinated protein. This cycle happens over and over again. And uh, then this is what's um, finally tagged for degradation. Okay, so now that we have the multi-ubiquitinated protein, we come to the second part of this, the actual degradation. So this is the guy, and to me this is kind of fascinating. This is the guy this barrel-like protein here, uh, called a proteasome, is the guy which is responsible for degrading the ubiquitin, okay? Uh, degrading the ubiquitinated target protein. So basically this is the ubiquitinated protein, uh, and this, so this structure, let's talk quickly about the proteasome structure. The proteasome structure has two alpha, subunits uh, or heptameric rings which consists of seven smaller subunits right then it has these two sandwiched uh, beta subunits here which 
are the catalytic, catalytically active subunits which actually do the degradation through nucleophilic attack on the ubiquitinated protein as it passes through. So this is kind of like the hamburger, a destructive hamburger, right, with alpha subunit bumps called 19S subunits and then your 20S subunit in the uh, center. So basically the ubiquitinated protein uh, is goes through, is kind of captured, right? You see in this diagram, this these arms kind of capture the ubiquitinated protein. Uh, then uh, the ubiquitinated protein travels through here, right? The proteasome barrel, right? Centrals 20, 20S barrel. And it's broken down piece by piece, unfolded. The 19S is doing the unfolding. And as the chain unfolds, the nucleophilic attack breaks bonds, breaks the amino acid bonds, and, res and creates the resultant uh, garbage, right? This protein looks like this, goes in, through, is captured by these 19S subunits, it's ubiquitinated, these are the yellow ubiquitin molecules, travels through the 20S barrel, and then this is the result, right? So you have uh, strands of amino acids, nine to seven units long, which are then uh, further recycled via the process of, via uh, uh, proteases, right? That's what I talked about in the beginning. And so that's basically it. So now um, I'm going to end this here because uh, we, we don't need to get into the protease function now. We need to just understand how this uh, all works, right? Um, and I think I broke it down pretty well. We'll get back into the cycling, the world of cyclins tomorrow and continue on with the cell cycle now that we understand how protein degradation works. There are some outstanding questions that I have, specifically how does the, you know, we know that the proteasome detects ubiquitinated proteins, that are uh, polyubiquitinated proteins, but how does um, the, even, even if that's the case, how does a protein, how is it known that a protein should be polyubiquitinated? And that's probably down to the specific process. Like in the case of the cyclins, we have to understand at some point uh, how the cyclins are indicated to be polyubiquitinated themselves so that they can be degraded at some time when proteasome activity is high enough. So that's a question for another day. Uh, so that's it for today. Hope you enjoyed this lecture, and I will see you later. Uh, like, subscribe, and leave a comment too if you find this helpful.